Okay, I'm going to start with a weird story. This is John Wesley. This is back in the 1700s, and John Wesley was this super famous preacher. He actually started the Methodist church, John Wesley. And he's up and he's preaching, and then there's this service that's going on, and he's given the message, and he's wearing a new bow tie. Okay, the bow tie is important. So he's wearing this bow tie, and this bow tie, the style of that day is the bow tie. Um, I guess they would tie it, and, and the ends of it would be super long and hanging down. You're going to be running right out to the store this afternoon, getting yourself a new bow tie. But that's the way he was wearing it, and it was driving this lady crazy in the audience. And so he preaches his sermon. They get to the end of the service and the woman comes right up to him, pastor, pastor at the very end and says, Mr. Wesley, the strings on your bow tie are much too long. It is an offense to me. So the pastor asked if anyone standing around this woman had a pair of scissors. And they did. This is somebody else. They did. I'm just, I'm looking for somebody and safe. He gives the scissors thank you. to the woman and says, Thank you, thank you. Control. And she does. And she clips off those ends that were annoying her. And after she clipped them off, he said to her, Are you sure they're right now? Yes, she said, That's much better. He says, Then let me have those shears for a moment. He says, I'm sure you wouldn't mind, dear lady, if I also give you a bit of correction. I don't mean to be cruel, but I must tell you, madam, that your tongue is an offense to me. It is too long. Please stick it out so that I might trim it a bit. Sometimes we have critics in our life. Sometimes we have people with opinions. How many of you have an opinion today? If you, got an, if you got a pulse, you've got an opinion, amen? And some of us have been swimming in the opinions of others our whole lives. So the title of today's message is, How Do You Handle Criticism When It Comes? Because the whole series that we're in right now is all on the, the things that we do with the tongue. It's the words that we speak and the fact that our words last. And, and some of the fact that, that our words last, it, it has to do with the, the words that we've heard and taken in. And sometimes those words have bound us up or they've been poisoned to us. And so today is how do we handle criticism when it comes to us in a healthy way? And I'm going to run the ending for you and just give you the whole map of today's message. I'm going to go to three points. Number one, here's how you handle critics. Don't get mad, number one. Amen. Number two, don't chase their approval because that's the opposite. And then number three, don't miss where God might be in the mix of things. Amen. So don't get mad, right? Don't, don't, don't fight them because you'll be fighting critics your whole life and you'll never open yourself up to anything good that they might be able to give you. And then don't chase their approval because then they'll become the God standard in your life. And that's that's murder on your ego. It's murder on your identity. It's murder on your mental health. It's murder on your spiritual health, right? Because there's just too many people in this world to please. You can never do it all. And some of those voices in your life are not good voices. And then don't miss God in the mix because sometimes God will use a donkey to give you truth. So let's start with number one. Don't get mad. Don't get mad. Like, like the, the psychologists tell us, like we have reactions, right? Like fight or flight when somebody comes after us and we feel like it's an attack. Don't do either. Don't, don't fight them and don't run away either, right? Like, like let the criticism come and evaluate it. So here is Numbers 22 or chapter 22, verse 28. This is Balaam and the donkey. And some of you guys heard this in Sunday school, but I'm going to review really quick. Balaam is a prophet, an Old Testament prophet, one of the weirdest prophets of all the prophets. Balaam. Balaam is this guy and he's on this way to do this thing and God doesn't want Balaam to do this thing. And so God wants to stop Balaam from doing this thing. And Balaam is journeying to this place to do the thing that God doesn't want him to do. And he's riding a donkey. And so what God does is God puts an angel in the road to kill Balaam. And the angel has a sword. And then here's the really fun twist in the story is God lets the donkey see the angel that Balaam can't see. 
And so the donkey tries to go around the angel. And the angel keeps moving as they go down. They finally go into this one particular road where the walls close in. They can't get away. And there's three times the donkey tries to avoid this angel. And he finally just lays down. And every single time, the the donkey tries to save Balaam's life and its own life. Balaam beats the donkey because he's mad. Verse 28, then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth and it said to Balaam, what have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? And Balaam answered the donkey, you've made a fool of me. If only I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. He's kind of mad at the donkey, but here's what he doesn't say, which is very odd to me. He doesn't say, wait, you're a donkey. How are you talking to me right now? I guess. He just rolls with it. Verse 31. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the, in the road with his sword drawn. And all of a sudden the prophet says, oh, you were trying to save my life. I get it now. I get it now. What's the point of the Balaam story? God will sometimes use donkeys to talk to you. God will sometimes use vehicles to bring his word to you that you do not appreciate the vehicle by which it comes. Some of you have some very particular donkeys in your own life who have spoken truth to you and you've struggled to hear it. And even when you describe that person, you do not use kind words like donkey, you use other words for them. And you might wish that God's word came to you in some other way. But God chose the word to go to the donkey. Do you think that was a mistake? Do you think that that was, God overlooked it that day? No. The most clear, direct thing he could have done that the father in heaven, king of the universe, probably should have done is just download the information directly to the prophet. Let him see the angel. Much more straightforward. But God doesn't do that. He sends it to the donkey. Why? To humble the prophet. Because God isn't just trying to get data to you. God is trying to shape your character. And sometimes the donkeys that are in your life that are bringing the words of God that you're ignoring and you're fighting against, you're sitting there beating them in the road, he's using them to adjust your humility. Your ego needs some treatment. Timothy Keller said, the biggest danger of receiving criticism is not to your your reputation, but to your heart. You feel the injustice of it and you feel sorry for yourself and it tempts you to despise not only the critic as a person, but the entire group of people from which they come. Those people, you mutter under your breath, those people. All this can make you prouder over time, more filled with an unholy, unhelpful pride in your life. Because every time someone comes and they criticize something in your life, you can push them down and elevate yourself in the picture mentally. It's sometimes what we do. And Keller's saying, maybe you need to humble yourself instead and let the whole thing notch down your pride. Some of us are not only very self-reliant, but some of us are very easily offended. We are, we are open, very, very open, too open to any slight or offense that might come our way. Are you easily offended today? Maybe God wants to toughen that part of you up a bit. Maybe. Maybe. Um, back Uh, When I was in a technology career before I became a pastor, I worked at a company called Caterpillar. And when I was working there, I was was running a tech system that they had, and I won't bore you with all the tech details. I'll just say this. I had to move some financial information from point A to point B. And I had to come in at midnight, and it was my job, and do it. And it's the first time I had ever done it before. And And I was moving it to this really old system is where it was going to go. And here's my list of excuses, right, for why I did it wrong. You see where I'm going. Like, 
I, I hadn't been trained properly in this old system and the old system didn't throw an error when things went wrong and all this kind of stuff. So I went and I hit all the buttons that I thought I was supposed to and I, it was supposed to go where it was supposed to go and, and, and I thought I was fine and I went home, went to sleep, came back in the next day and it had not gone, it had not been successful and everybody was mad. And man, I had all my list of excuses and this was a, a department of May 300 people, and I got taken into the department head's office. Jennifer was her name. She's a wonderful leader. And she wanted to know what had gone wrong, and she was very skeptical of my answers. And, and I left, and I thought that that was it. And then we had a department meeting maybe a couple of weeks later, and she's sitting there talking to everybody gathered, three, all 300 of us in this room. And as she's giving everybody updates on what's going on, she, she mentions the data process that had gone wrong, and she throws up her hands and says, we still don't know what happened there. And the implication was very clear, because everybody knew I had done it. And she just, mm, right in front of everybody. Did I like that? No. I did not enjoy that. I wanted to stand up. I wanted to defend myself. I was very angry. I was very bitter at her for drawing me out in that way. I can look back on it now and I can see some value in what she was trying to do for that group of people. But she was my donkey that day. You get what I'm saying? She had, she had valuable stuff for me. She had valuable correction for me, but it did not come in a package that I would have preferred, right? Like I would have, been, I would have preferred, take me away quietly where no one else is going to bash me. I would like a big speech of understanding of how much you appreciate everything that I bring to the table and how this was one mistake out of all these other things that had gone right and you love me and you're merciful. I would have liked all of that stuff to package the one criticism that you were going to bring to me. And she didn't do any of that. She just, and it's hard. But the truth is, in my mind, I was fighting her. In my mind, I was putting her down. In my mind, I was criticizing everything about the way that she brought the truth to me and not just stopping and appreciating the truth that was brought to me. There was a blessing there. And I was going to miss it. 1 Peter 3, 9 says, Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Amen. It, it's tit for tat, right? It's like, like people come against you and they insult you. Don't insult back. If you do, you're going to be talking and not listening. Amen. You're going to be fighting and not learning. Right? And, and, and if you stop fighting and you start to learn, you might get a blessing at the end is, is what he is, Peter is promising there. You might inherit a blessing if you stop retaliating. Maybe, just maybe, our fragile ego will start to die. Maybe, just maybe, my fragile ego needed to start to die. And by ego dying, here's what I mean. I mean the, the foundation needs to shift. The foundation needs to shift where I get my value from God the Father, not from other people around me. That's what we have to move to. Not other people's approval and not even the approval of yourself because that's no good either. We're going to talk more about that. Next step in how to handle your critics, don't chase approval. Don't chase approval. Chasing approval, that's fear. Chasing approval, that's, that's like an addiction where you get addicted to the approval of people, what grade they give you, right? Like I, I, I preached uh, several months ago a message called uh, the perfection infection, perfection infection. It was the idea that you have to be a superstar all the time. And if you're not a superstar, you can't be okay with you. Some of you guys might remember that. This approval addiction is just a little bit different. It says you can't be happy unless they think you're a superstar. Yeah. And you can be a superstar, but if they don't think you're a superstar and they don't acknowledge you as a superstar, then you're not a superstar and you can't be happy with yourself. That's addicted to the approval of others. You are not thin enough. You don't make enough money. Your education did not go high enough. You did not marry the right person. 
You don't call home nearly often enough on the telephone, and you don't visit enough. You didn't stay long enough at our party on Christmas Day, and you're not as smart as your sister, and why aren't you as smart as your sister? Any of this sound familiar? And what happens when those kinds of expectations and criticisms come into your life and then you attach yourself to that and you feel like you've got to measure up to those things and, and you're in bondage to those things. Do you see how that can become an addiction? And some of us, we just move the addiction around, right? Like, like we become embittered toward this particular person and we stop listening to what they say, even though they haunt us for the rest of, their life, for the rest of our lives. But then we move to other people and we start becoming addicted to their approval of us next. Uh, I've got like a second, third cousin and we would be at family reunions and parties together and, and he was married to this lady and, and they were a young couple and they had just had a baby and she had gained a little bit of weight after the baby was born and at family functions, he would call her fatty he would call her fatty with kind of a smile on his face and a kind of a smile in his voice like, this is funny, right? This is a little <laughs> joke, right? But he was doing that in front of other people, bad enough if it was just the two of them, but he's doing that in front of other people. And none of us are laughing and, and, and what's he doing? And, and, and you realize he's trying to control. He's desperate to get a behavior or an outcome. And so he is cruelly trying to control. Do you see, there's a kind of criticism here that you shouldn't listen to. There's a kind of criticism that I don't care who it comes from, it's destructive and it's bondage to you. You shouldn't listen to that. That kind of stuff is awful. That kind of stuff will hurt you. Approval addiction is a place of misery. Approval addiction is a place of misery. You're living for others. It's a constant stress. Some, some of those voices, they are cruel, and it's impossible because there's far too many of them, and approval addiction is not God's will for you. And when I describe that, I know that for some of you, that is not just interesting information. That is trauma that's in your past. And for some of you, that's trauma that's still over you, is people that have spoken expectations that have truly scarred you. Spouses and ex-spouses, parents, spectators. I've got some kids in college, kids. I've got some young adults in college. Everybody in my house is now an adult. So I've got some young adults in college. And their professors do this thing at the beginning of the semester. They define what's called a rubric. Can you say the word rubric? Rubric. Rubric. It's a weird word. It's hard to say. Rubric. But what they say is, if you're going to write this paper, it's got to be this many pages long. It's got to have these topics, have this kind of grammar. The citations have got to look this way. And if you do, and you do all of these things, then it's an A. And so what the rubric tells you is, here's what your goal is. I need you to do it this way. And if you do, the rubric also becomes your judgment. And it tells you what the grade is going to be. Here's an A, here's a B, here's a C. That's the rubric. It defines it for you. You live your entire life with people trying to tell you what the rubric for a successful life is. For many of us, we started with our parents and then teachers and even Sunday school teachers and pastors came along and said, here is the rubric for having an A plus life. And you believed them. And you let that be spoken over you. And it's still over you. And, and, and here's the thing. And this is what the scripture is going to be telling us today. Is you can't give in to the rubric that people have put over your life. Also, you can't so much fight all that stuff, all that criticism from other people that you say, I will not listen to anybody because what you're actually doing is you're making yourself the God of your life. You create a vacuum if you rebel against it, you say, I won't listen to them. What you'll do is you'll start to define for yourself what success looks like. You'll make your own rubric, and that is also cruel and impossible to achieve. What you need is you need the third step where you come over to God and you say, God, you define what my rubric is for me. You define where I'm going. 
you set my goals and you will finally judge me for it. And I know that word judge tweaks us a bit, but judgment when it comes to God at his throne is good. It is always good. So Galatians 1.10 Obviously, I am not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. Just get into those words for just a second. It's the Apostle Paul there. He says, I am not going to be an approval addict. I will only be the servant of God. God will be my master, and I will be his servant because he will give me a good rubric. <laughs> Not only will his goals be attainable, not only will his heart toward me be loving and accepting and merciful, but let's be real. For everything that I fail and disappoint him in, Jesus has got me covered. Because that's the way it works with God. Don't let cruel critics keep you in bondage. Um, there, was a, there was a time, this is years and years ago, I was at um, another church, and I was preaching, and, and um, there was a guy, his name was Greg, and after the sermon was over, and I forget what the, the topic was, but after the sermon was over, he was convinced that I had said a particular line, a, a particular truth that is against the Bible. He was just sure I had said it. And so we met, had a meeting, had some other leaders there, and, and, and we're walking through it, and, and, and one of the other leaders had actually brought a recording of the message from that day, because it had been audio recorded. There was no video uh, recording at that church at that time, but it had been audio recorded, and we actually played the section back for him, and it wasn't there, the thing that he was sure that I had said. And after we played it, and, and it felt settled, he kind of looked over at me with a smile and said, well, that could have been taken into the back of the church on a machine and it could have been doctored. It's like, dude, you, you respect our technical ability way too much. Because <laughs> <laughs> not only do we not know how to do that at that time, but none of our volunteer tech people would have cared nearly um, about me enough probably to go back and try to fix things that I broke in the message. Um, it, it just, it wasn't, it wasn't realistic. But he was just stuck. He was stuck. And, 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 and let me just say, there are times that I preach sermons and people come and they bring me correction or they bring me suggestions and I welcome that and I'm thankful for that and God makes me better through the body of Christ and I love that. But that day with him, he wasn't someone that I was able to please. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. He was not someone that I was able to get his approval. And if I had kept myself connected to him, I would have gone mad trying. And some of you guys are still connected to someone with unrealistic expectations. Some of them aren't even alive anymore. You just still hear their voice. I know, I know. So how do we handle critics? Step three, don't miss God. So number one, don't, don't fight against them because God might be, be trying to bring good stuff to you through someone that you don't expect. Step two is don't be addicted to their approval of you. But step three, don't miss that God might be in there somehow. So Galatians chapter 2, verse 11, but when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face for what he did was very wrong. I'm going to pause you right there in this scene. Some of you guys know where this is going. This is out of Galatians. This is a classic um, scene that is painted in the book of Galatians. There are two principal people in this scene that you have to know. It is Paul and it is Peter. And, and you might think growing up in the church, Paul and Peter were probably always buddies, right? They were probably all, always happy with each other, right? Because they were Christians. And aren't Christians always happy with each other? <sighs> no. And I love that the Bible is honest. At all times, it is just honest. 
And even really early on when the church was just in this beautiful place and Jesus had just died for them all and risen from the dead and they're all just like sweeping across the ancient world, this grassroots Christian movement is going. You've still got leaders, even at that time, fighting with each other, disagreeing. And so that this is one of those scenes. So we're going to read some honesty. Here's what it's about. See, there was a lot of question in the early church about what you had to do to get saved, what you had to do to make it into heaven, what you had to do for God to be pleased with you, to survive the judgment. And the truth is you have to reach out to Jesus Christ and you have to believe on him and confess that Jesus is Lord. That's Romans 10, 9 and 10. That's what it says. But even though all you have to do is surrender to Jesus Christ, people were putting all kinds of extra things on top of it. They were stuff from the Old Testament law. The Old Testament law that told you you couldn't eat bacon. God help us, how did they survive? <laughs> and they had all of these rules that they had to follow. And one of them was you had to get circumcised. Very painful, right? You had to get circumcised. And, 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 and so there were Jews that were like, well, we're okay with eating bacon. You can go ahead and eat bacon and be saved. But you got to be circumcised because that's like this core thing, right? Like, like Jesus still meant for you that you had to get circumcised. And, and that might seem like a weird old conversation for you to have. But some of you have been to churches before where if you were there and you knew Jesus and loved Jesus, but you had not been water baptized yet, people would treat you like you were a second class Christian. Yep. Or maybe you're not even saved. And if you don't come to church enough, and we're watching your church attendance, by the way. If you didn't come to church often enough, we're not. I'm sorry, we're not watching your church attendance. <laughs> but I'm saying there's all kinds of metrics that people can be judging each other on and throwing fellow Christians into these little categories. Like you haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit and you don't show the evidence of speaking in tongues. And maybe you're not a real Christian because of that. Or maybe you're going to barely squeak into heaven, but you're going to be kind of a, you know, stepchild kind of a thing. Nothing against stepchildren. But we do this, and they were doing it at the time. It's, that was right there in the first century. And, and so what had happened, Paul's in this other church called Antioch. It's in the city of Antioch. And they were reaching out to lots of Gentiles who weren't Jews, and they hadn't been circumcised. And they're giving them the gospel of grace of Jesus. And, and it's all beautiful. And then Peter shows up, and there's a big potluck because I'm a Baptist, and we call them potlucks in the Baptist church. And so they're having this big potluck. And, and, and while everybody's eating, Peter's sitting with um, Gentile people, and it's all good. But then later... Some people from James, it's going to say, is going to come in and they're more ultra-religious and kind of pressure and they're going to put some pressure on Peter and Peter's going to do some wrong stuff. But when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face. What he did was very wrong. When he first arrived, he ate with the Gentile believers who were not circumcised. But afterward, when some friends of James came, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. <clears throat> he was afraid of criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. And as a result, other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy. Even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. What's happening? Peter's doing the right thing at first, treating everybody the same. And then some pressure comes in, and he gives in to the pressure. Why? Because he's letting other people define the rubric for his life. Do you see it? And because of that, he starts chasing them instead of chasing God. Because that's what always happens to us. And so Paul's got to get involved. Verse 14, when I saw that they were not following the truth of the gospel message, I said to Peter in front of all the others, since you, a Jew by birth, have discarded the Jewish laws and are living like a Gentile because he's eating bacon at the time, why are you now trying to make these Gentiles follow the Jewish traditions? You and I are Jews by birth. We're not pagans or sinners like the Gentiles. Yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law, for no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. Amen. <clears throat> if you've not heard this in church before, you need to hear it loud and clear. It is not your church attendance. It is not your financial giving. It is not how many diapers you change in the nursery that will get you into heaven. It is not the number of sexual partners you've had, the number of marriages and divorces you've had. 
any of those things. They, they will not get you into heaven and they will not get you into hell. It is only reaching out to Jesus Christ and surrendering your life to him that will decide your internal destiny for you. Amen. Right? It's, and it's not because God doesn't care. It's because Jesus paid. It's because Jesus paid for everything that we've done wrong, every way that we've disappointed God. I said, he defines the rubric for us. He defines the rubric for us, and then he sends Jesus to come and qualify us. He gets us the A, and Peter was preaching a different gospel. Do you see that? By categorizing people, treating them like they're different based on their behavior, you can't do that in the church. But now I got to see it through Peter's eyes for a second, just a little bit, just for a second. He just got rebuked publicly by Paul. Do you think that was a fun day? No way. Paul, by the way, at this point in time, just get a little church history. He had not done all his missionary journeys yet. He had not planted all those churches. He was not this super like, like powerful and, and popular apostle. Paul was just Paul. And he's out there going toe to toe with Peter. And Peter's Peter. How dare you, dude? In front of all these people, and I don't know exactly what the tone was, okay? I don't know exactly what the, the scene looked like, but I just got to imagine Peter struggled because he's got a bit of a donkey there talking to him. And then what blows my mind is that Peter listened and that this whole scene ends well. And I'm not going to go into the rest of it, but Peter actually takes Paul's advice. Peter goes on to keep affirming Paul in his ministry throughout the rest of his ministry. He holds Paul up. And Paul took this whole scene and wrote it into the Bible for heaven's sake, right? Like if it wasn't bad enough on Peter, it actually got documented for all of church history. Of course, we're going to learn from it, but don't you think that was hard on Peter? Sure. Don't you think it, like he had to like go through all of that with God the Father, and you just wonder how that prayer might have gone between him and God the Father. Like, Father, really? Like this? And maybe the Father came and said, maybe let the tone go. And maybe forgive him for the way. And maybe forgive him for the words. And maybe forgive him for the lack of sensitivity. But my treasure is still in what he's saying to you. Amen. Don't miss it. You know the uh, show Storage Wars? Storage wars. So there's these storage units and they get abandoned. And I guess in California, you can go and you can bid on a storage unit that's been abandoned, right? And they're all full of garbage, essentially. And, and there's this one particular show, Storage Wars, and they had a person go and, and there, was a, there was a storage unit and they gave $1,000 for the storage unit. And once they got inside of it, I guess there was a box of old Spanish gold, pieces of eight, buried in all that. It took three guys to lift it out of that storage unit. They sold it for $500,000. Yeah, fun little tidbit, right? Sometimes do we have to Teflon a lot of garbage away and just let it slide so that we can keep the treasure that God's got for us, right? Because God's my master. He sets the rubric. But if God is speaking through a donkey, I've got to let that happen. Right? But I've got a Teflon the rest. Because if I get so hung up on the tone and on the speech and the way it happened, I'll never get any of the good. I'll miss the treasure too. And if you don't know what Teflon is, they put it on the pan so the eggs don't stick, right? It's so good. We used to, anyway. Uh... <laughs> First Corinthians 4, 3. Paul says, I care very little if I'm judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Amen. Do you see how much joy he's got in the fact that he'll be judged by a good and loving God? Three rubrics. Which one are you? This journey is yours. Romans 14, 4. Who are you to judge anyone, someone else's servant? To their own master... Servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. 
so Paul kind of covers it all in these two verses. He says, I am not accountable to all the other people. And I don't even judge myself because I'm not accountable to me. I'm only accountable to God. And he imagines the judgment. So <clears throat> just go there for a second in your mind's eye, in your imagination. Put yourself at the judgment. There you are before God. And if you, do, if you, if you never imagined this before, you need to do this more often because that judgment will define your eternity. And you need to think about that so that it adjusts the way that you live right now. But there you are and you're standing before God and it's the final judgment. It's the only judgment that matters. The question is, will you stand there? Will you stand or will you fall? Will you make it or will you not make it? Will you be affirmed or will you not? Will you get the A plus or will you not? Because it's the only judgment that matters. And he's just taking us right there. And he says, and we will stand because he's able to make us stand. God, don't miss that for the Lord is able to make them stand. He doesn't say you're able to stand. He says God is able to make you stand. That's the only reason you survive that day. There are a lot of people in this room, if I took you physically and I put you at a family reunion, you wouldn't be able to stand. You wouldn't be able to stand in front of those gazes and those looks and those whispers, those expectations that you know are there. How about your high school class reunion? What if I sent you back there? Would you stand? Many of us have never gone because we know. Because <laughs> whatever room you stick us in, you know there's expectations there, right? Whatever group of people. And so the Bible just takes all of it away and says there will be a moment and it'll just be you and it'll just be him and when it's just you and just him none of those voices matter they won't matter and what's amazing is his voice loves you what's amazing is his voice has got mercy for you he has separated your sins the scripture says as far as the east is from the west Everything that you have ever done, every disappointment, every, every goal God even had for you that you failed to achieve in the past, in the present, even the stuff you don't know about yet. Do you know Jesus died for all of that? When he took on the cross, he died for you and he died for all your failures. And he just didn't die for the things you screwed up, but the stuff that you were supposed to do, Jesus did it all. And so his resume, his righteousness, the Bible calls it, has been applied to your account. You are holy and righteous before God. And that's why he says, he's like, it's okay if you can't stand on that day. He's able to make you stand. Do you see the father like strengthening your knees and setting you back up? I mean, come on. Because we're all going to need it, amen? amen? Like you're going to come before him and you're just going to drop. Oh, God. Guys, this isn't just theological stuff, okay? This, this, like, the rubric of other people over me to my own, this has been my journey. This has been my life. This is what, but what, what I've wrestled with for so long. And tiny little wins and God trying to set me free from old family members and old professors. And it takes time, Yes but the journey is absolutely essential. You've got to get your foundation right. Make God alone your master. Let's pray. Would you guys stand? Jesus, we thank you for truth that changes us. We thank you, God, for your kind words to us today. Lord, set us free, God. Would you... God, where we've been addicted to the, the approval of other people, God, would you, would you right now break the bonds, God, that are in this room? And God, even, even as we were walking through this message today, Lord, I know some, Lord, were sitting in the seats, God, and they were feeling this emotional tug to a person in their past, maybe even in their present. And you know that 
if they're not happy with you, you, you struggle with peace. And God, I pray that you would disconnect that bond today. And Lord, I pray that you would attach us to you because you are the only safe master. We love you, Jesus. Thank you in Christ's name.